Australia is an incredibly resource-rich country. With bountiful amounts of gold, silver, copper, iron, rare earth elements, platinum group metals and the best damn opals you can find on our planet, and this is to name only a few of our noteworthy resources, because in reality we basically have it all. But even though we are one of the largest iron exporters in the world, that iron is coming from the exceptionally ancient land of Western Australia, and is actually a completely different form of iron ore to the one we're going to cover in this video, in that it's far more pure, and the type of process that formed the ore body to begin with actually no longer exists. But iron in Eastern Australia? Well, that's a different story. Because it's the youngest part of Australia, with it being little more than a deep ocean 500 million years ago. So where did this iron come from then? We're going to attempt to answer that question in this video, and we're also going to take a closer look at this site and discover why its existence is so strange and so unique to begin with in this part of Australia. So I'm here in an area known as Lal Lal in Victoria, Australia, and this is the only iron mine to have ever been attempted in Victoria. And for a good reason, as economically viable iron deposits really don't exist here. But the fact that we can find it here means they're the kind of iron deposits that aren't exactly high quality to say the least. And why is this? Well, because it produced pig iron which is the name given to a crude form of iron that contains the highest amount of impurities, and is therefore the cheapest as a result. The fact that this iron mine was even attempted to begin with is quite incredible, honestly, but there was a logical reason for its formation. The gold rush that occurred here in the mid to late 1800s saw the need for lots of iron for a magnitude of differing reasons, from railway construction to machinery and more. And even though pig iron was crude and impure, it was more than suitable to do the job. But even with this, the mine didn't last long. Within a decade, the company went bust, with the mine opening in 1875 and closing in 1884, and any further attempts to reopen it in the future would prove unsuccessful. This mine also had a smelting works on site, but in present day, not so much is left apart from the insanely large chimney that they built here. But I gotta admit, it must have been fun being the miner who was responsible for heading downhill, as they would fly down it along with a minecart that was filled with iron ore, in order to unload it before making the journey uphill again. Now as you can see, this chimney hangs pretty precariously, and probably doesn't have many decades left. The entire chimney was actually once wrapped in an external layer, that unfortunately no longer exists. And there used to be a bridge that connected to the top of it as well. And look at those massive iron rich rocks that they used to line it. Unbelievable stuff. Those rocks are actually the hard rock version of the ore that these guys were mining. During my studies into this operation, I couldn't find anything regarding what type of mine this was. Was it a hard rock one, meaning they pulled solid rock out, crushed it and extracted the iron through smelting? Or an alluvial one? But the moment I got here, it was obvious to me that this operation was most definitely an alluvial one. Meaning they found an ancient waterway and they were mining the soil-like particles of iron that had eroded from the surrounding ore, which they readily scooped up by the shovelful and threw into the furnace, alongside some locally sourced limestone from a nearby ancient coral reef to use as a flux, and locally sourced charcoal, which was created by the mass felling of the old eucalyptus forests that stood here in abundance, much to my dismay. But I get it, you gotta do what you gotta do, and life in the 1880s was harsh and unforgiving, especially in Australia. But as you can see, they were chasing the curvature of an old stream. Rounded quartz exists here, but not much, meaning they mined this for gold and took much of the quartz along with any other cobbles before separating it from the gold. And this makes sense, as gold is what they were chasing to begin with, which more than likely led to this discovery of iron ore. The fact that this quartz is exceptionally rounded tells me that this was either a very long-lived stream or a major one. It seems to be the latter rather than the former, and you can see that the miners left the rocks on either side of the riverbank behind. And these are the rocks that the alluvial iron is eroding from. But why is iron here to begin with? Well, this is the fun part. The geological setting allowed for the decomposition and accumulation of anything that lived and died, along with anything that was eroded from here in the past 400 or so million years, since it was uplifted above dry land from the deep sea where it once lay. 
and this area has always existed as a kind of bowl shape, topographically. Recent lava flows have offered quite a bit of infill, though, which obscures the real topographical nature that existed here throughout much of history, as this whole area was more or less one big dome shape from west to east, from here to here. And it still is, even with the recent wave of volcanism, which added some 50 metres or 164 feet worth of volcanic material in the form of lava flows. And the river systems here seem to have always run south. So in the past 7 million years, the land became dominated by volcanic eruptions, which released an immense amount of lava, building up and covering much of the ancient land that had more or less existed in the same state for the past 300 million years. And one way of gauging just how intense this really was is by looking at this big shelf of basalt over here. As you can see, this valley is cut very deep, and the land here is pretty damn steep as a result of that. But the lava flows that formed that shelf used to reach all the way up to where I'm standing and above it when they were freshly released. The Murrabul River has cut through the basalt in time like a knife through butter. And after the basalt was eroded, it continued carving through the ancient sedimentary layers, forming this valley. Before this land was a dome in its shape though, we had sedimentary material that was deposited in a deep sea setting. The accumulation of which began around 550 to 600 million years ago, with this sediment flowing east from the shorelines of the ancient supercontinent of Gondwana. The origin of these sediments occurred from rocks in South Australia and Antarctica, which was joined to Australia back then. These deep sea sediments would eventually become uplifted, beginning around 500 or so million years ago, and after multiple tectonic events, it would eventually be thrust out of the sea. One of these tectonic collisions was a continent-to-continent -continent collision, an event that's known for creating pronounced mountain ranges and for forming major intrusive batholith magma chambers, which bubble up and coalesce deep within the Earth. This collision was that of the microcontinent that Tasmania sat atop, and it collided with this part of Victoria. This collision led to the inevitable fusing of Tasmania with Victoria. To the west of here, we have the beginning of the Brownhill Ranges, which is marked by a major reverse fault, and is one of the many lines that mark the site of an ancient subduction zone. And these ranges mark the western extent of the dome. And to the east, we have another major fault, created when Tasmania collided with Western Victoria, which only served to further crumple and buckle the surrounding area, producing uplift and creating tremendous mountain ranges that once stretched high up into the sky. This iron mine is located just west of this major fault, and even though the land within the dome is mountainous, and was once a far taller and much more mightier mountain range, it had always been dwarfed by the mountains to its east and west making this area more of a basin of sorts, even with it being mountainous, as surprising as that sounds. The dome-like structure of Lal Lal and the surrounding area really began 360 million years ago, following the collision with Tasmania. As the tectonics here began to settle down, massive waves of magma intruded into the crust in the final stages of this continent-to-continent -continent collision. And this magma baked the sedimentary rocks that were on top of it, transforming the rocks into something known as a hornfowl, which is a label given to a rock that has been metamorphosed as a result of high heat but low pressure being applied. And this type of thing occurs when rocks make contact with magma. So after this intrusion 360 million years ago, the land more or less became geologically stable around the 300 million year mark, where it remained up until the recent volcanic eruptions that suffocated out the ancient landscape occurred. By this point, erosion had really worked the ancient mountain range that existed here down. So much so that the underlying, now solidified magma chamber, which is the guy we spoke of who intruded here 360 million years ago, became exposed to the surface. And in various areas, the highly weathered granodiorite and granite rocks that once churned within this deep magma chamber lie in plain sight. When we view this massive magma chamber on gravity, we can see the aforementioned dome-like shape. And geez, it was massive. This was a gigantic, almost circular magma chamber. And because it solidified beneath the earth rather than erupting, it's known as a batholith. This batholith was once located many kilometers beneath the surface of the earth when it was active, showing just how much erosion has occurred here over time. 
Now that we have the geological and geographical setting down, we can discuss how these iron deposits form to begin with. Along with them exist deposits of brown coal, and both are linked in an indirect manner, as both of these deposits require a depositional environment for them to form to begin with meaning both the brown coal in Lal Lal and the iron deposits require an area where material was allowed to sit and accumulate for them to form, as opposed to them being transported out by the waterways, like what would occur in a well-drained area. So this entire bowl shape was and still is an area of stagnation, meaning anoxic or oxygen-less conditions prevail. As you can see, the town of Lal Lal has areas of major lake deposits, showing water is still sitting here rather than leaving. So it's evident by these deposits that this area was one that was dominated by swampland, lakes, and subtropical to tropical rainforests throughout most of its history, as coal is the result of the partial decomposition of plant material that's subject to increased pressure and temperatures that occurs in an airless environment. Which essentially means things died, then more things died and covered up those things, then even more things died and covered up those things. And layer after layer of organic material gets built up over time, and the pressure inflicted upon the bottommost layers by that or by any tectonic element eventually turns this biological material into brown coal. But only if it's in an anoxic environment. So this area was definitely one that was dominated by swamplands. When this part of Australia was closer to the equator, this area became tropical, and as it drifted away, subtropical. And that was when much of the iron-rich limonite deposits were formed. Limonite is an iron ore that is actually a mixture of different iron oxides that have been weathered out of a host rock, and that accumulate as a result. Because iron has a heavy specific gravity, it tends to accumulate, and their heaviness makes them resistant to being transported out by water. And because its existence is one that's formed as a byproduct of something, that makes it a secondary material. The actual meaning of the word limonite in ancient Greek is wet meadow or marshy lake. And this is because limonite is also known as bog iron ore. And bog iron was a very important early form of iron ore that humans mined during the BC times. But the fact that it's associated with the many marshes that exist in Europe is where bog iron got its name and it serves to further highlight the swampy anoxic conditions that prevailed here. This land is one that is more or less stuck in a dome-like shape, and this is what was necessary to form part of the limonite, aka the iron ore, which was derived from two sources. The first was from organisms known as iron bacteria, which convert ferric to soluble ferrous salts in conditions free of oxygen. The second is from the erosion of the very same quartz reefs that the miners were already chasing for gold. Only it came from the minerals within these reefs that were ignored, and in some cases despised. As pyrites, which is also known as fool's gold for the fact that it does look very much like gold does, thus its nickname, occurs in these veins. But it, along with other iron-bearing minerals, became oxidized and hydrated as erosion slowly worked to whittle the quartz reefs that they were contained within, down over time, and these iron-bearing minerals would become deposited and would accumulate within these acidic swamplands and the stagnant, barely flowing streams. And in time, they would be turned into limonite deposits. Now, it's kind of been a goal of mine to accumulate and smelt some iron for years. So if you'd like to see a video with me attempting to do that, let me know by clicking the like button. I'll use some of the same alluvial material that these miners used. This deep red soil that's just saturated with iron. The soil itself is literally just rust. But yeah, limonite is basically a blanket term to describe an ore that's an accumulated deposit of many different iron-bearing minerals, and in general they're a combination of hematite, magnetite, and pyrites. These iron deposits are the result of both bacteria, alongside tens to hundreds of millions of years worth of erosion that occurred in a basin-like topographical area which allowed for the accumulation of virtually anything that died, and anything that weathered or eroded. A truly fascinating origin story. These iron deposits aren't really valued today, but during the Iron Age, around 1200 BC, our ancestors would have absolutely killed to have had access to this, and we know that for a fact. Damn murderous humans. So this is the story of the iron deposits in Lal Lal. Now these aren't unique, and I've seen many areas in Victoria that were saturated with similar looking iron deposits. But this was the only place where this type of endeavor was ever attempted, and it's looking like it's going to stay that way for a very long time. 
Thanks for watching.